about this book is that first it offers an alternative view to the uh, the, um, uh, the concrete jungle concept. What Desmond Morris did is that he introduced instead the, the concept of human zoo. So in his opinion, the city is not uh, a jungle, but it's a, um, a cage. It's an environment that is, uh, that is uh, very small. And we don't act as animals in nature, but we act as animals who are in cage. And the second reason why I've been interested in this book is because it's about alienation. So Desmond Morris explains how, in his opinion, uh, living in this uh, urban environment makes us uh, behave in a way that is unnatural, in his opinion. Do, do, have you noticed this, this uh, sort of behaviors in humans who live in cities? Um, well, Animals in cage, like you know, human behaviour like animal behaviour changes depending on where it is and whether it's in a cage or not, you know, it doesn't really matter, like it's just about the constraints that are on the particular circumstance and, you know, I think if you think about it that way, there's no real difference between what you would expect to change in animals and humans. So, you know, so an animal example, like, you know, if you, if you restrict the amount of space that an animal has compared to what it usually has, you know, of course it'll get agitated, but the same thing will happen with people. Yeah. So, uh, In terms of not so much the zoo as, as animal behaviour generally, there are a lot of commonalities between, the, between human behaviour and other animals' behaviour. And specifically, one of the things I'm quite interested in is the behaviour of crowds and herds. And as an economist, there are a range of good and bad reasons why the signals that the herd or the crowd reveals can be useful, destructive or not. Um, and so a lot of people have heard about the idea of the wisdom of crowds, that yeah. collective wisdom of, of people all aggregated together has some value. But the problem comes when that you have to assume that all that wisdom is uncorrelated. Um, but herding the connection with, I guess, some examples from the animal kingdom would be herding social learning. If you're wanting to find food or mates or shelter, then following the crowd would be quite useful for too. So an urban, an urban environment, some of those things is going to be particularly profound. Yeah, and a few other interesting economic themes that actually come out of the human zoo that might come up later on. All right, uh, Alex, so you're, you're, you've, you've done your arts that we see, you based on you. Sure. Is it because um, you see connection between behavior of animals where they are in captivity and some of the behaviors of humans when they are living in a city? Not so much that. I, I just find that if, the, if, I, if I may explain a little bit about how I organize the, the visuals in the show. Um, once upon a time, I used to work in London fly in here quite frequently. And I realized one thing, which was that the attraction of coming here is like, you know, wow, it's amazing, the opposite of what we would think about a zoo. But what I noticed was that a lot of people, when they, they've been here a while, it's very hard for them to leave. It's almost like going, they can go on holiday, but it's almost like, I don't know, is it okay outside? You know, and I, I found that very interesting. Ha having worked, let's say, like, like this in the field of marketing research with behavioral science in terms of how people react in terms of responding to stimulus. That's what I noticed that London is, it's not a lot of time, so arguably you're gonna, you know, your decision-making process, you're, you're gonna be, you're gonna have another level of stress on, on your site, and so I understood that that was very interesting. Lewis, so when, when I saw your pictures, I could not stop myself uh, of making an, uh, a connection with this concept of people being in captivity. Because many of your pictures are about offices, you see many people in, in, these, in these small rooms. Uh, would you agree with the interpretation? Would, would you, do, do you feel uh, close to this concept of us humans living in, in cages in cities? I mean, initially I would have said no. Um, 
when I was making this one, I was going out very late at night and actually, you know, I've seen almost no one in such London. It okay. didn't really feel like a human zoo at all. It felt uh, the opposite. It felt fun people with some very kind of, um, uh, might be almost like a kind of empty fish tank at times. But, um, but no, I think kind of thinking about this talk is maybe something we consider that. You know, I've been thinking this, this work basically originates out of uh, my frustration at London and the way London is changing. London's a city I've already lived in, and um, it's become really, for me and most other people of my age, very unaffordable. So I've been feeling like I need to leave. But at the same time, there's this, as you said, this kind of magnetic force to London that keeps you here, makes it very difficult to make that decision to just go, just go somewhere else. You can go on holiday, you can go away, maybe for a short period, but to leave forever is like. Very, very difficult decision to make. So, yeah, I mean, I have started now to feel actually more well, maybe there is there is a kind of uh, there is some weight to that idea of London just being like a zoo. But at the same time, you know, I kind of um, it's interesting to hear these comparisons between human behaviour and animal mm -hmm. behaviour. But I've always I've always been suspicious about people who project human behaviour onto animals, and I kind of feel like maybe it's an animal. It's a problem with doing that in the opposite way around. You know, so to take down the way and directly project it onto the way we all behave uh, is kind of equally problem for us. Yeah, and, and, and to, to your point, uh, in the book of Desmond Boris, he describes humans like if they were uh, animals. He makes many analogies. But he also explains that we are different and we can, uh, we can put something else in our behavior than just being animal. He speaks about creativity and this sort of stuff, and, and he says that this is the difference between us and animals. Animals cannot create anything in a cage. We humans have this capacity of creating something different from this captivity. So it's one point that he raised. So, who has. Uh, are you all um, feeling happy in London and free? Or uh, <laughs> is it a different story? Yes? Um, I've been living in London. 20 years and been like generally fine. It was a you know escape periodically, short periods of time, come back. Generally, fairly happy with that. And then last year I started consistently working outside of London in a very green open space, which is literally like my empty marshland. And there's some. And I'd done a couple of trips, a walking trip in the Pyrenees. It was 20 days very remote, with a friend, so it was social still, but it was very green, very remote, very open. And since then I've struggled uh, with the sort of urban density, but that's only happened as a result, I think, of s stepping out in the first place. So I didn't have a problem with it until I had escaped or had left. I don't feel I'm in this at all. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with yourself. I found it very difficult to leave London. I've lived in London all my life. Yeah. But I find it a very liberating place. I okay. can go anywhere. There's 208 tube stations around about that. I can go anywhere tomorrow. You know, I, I can do anything I want. I do not feel at all. Maybe I, I have a privileged life, but I do not feel privileged. I think it could be age-related. <coughs> when I was young, um, in Netherlands, I think was a country sign. I just really liked the big big city, big lights, big everything, you know, the nightlife, everything else. And now it's, it's kind of taking its toll, and I think it's because I'm aging, and I really, really yearn to get out of here and go out to, to the countryside. The air annoys me, the noise, the pollution, the traffic is getting to me in a way that never has before. So I think, in my case, it possibly is age-related. But London's also changing, right? the green spaces are getting smaller. So if you, I live in North London and I remember there were marsh areas and near top of marshes. And now that area, is, you have housing that's been there for over a decade. The children are growing up in areas where there's less green space. Some of those green spaces are just unloved spaces where the weeds grow. There isn't a sense of that land being used for grazing or used for growing anything. It's just where they haven't built anything yet. So in the sense there is less green and there's also the sense of the species as a whole, with mega cities growing so fast. I mean, if London is growing at 100,000 people a year now, 
and Shanghai, it's 21 million. We are, we are, this is a great open space. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah they, they think it's wonderful. He, the comp what Desmond explained in his book is that, in his opinion, uh, earlier in history we were living in smaller uh, communities and it was all fine. And then it became too big. And uh, so, but now it's, it, as you said, it's going, it's growing even faster and faster. And when, especially when we see cities like Shanghai and so on. When, 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 if you've been to Shanghai or if you've been to any of the big cities, would you say, oh, it's really impossible to leave this, this place? Or well, they do. Yeah. Twenty-one million people do. Yeah. and you realize that it's, it, the structure of London, this is not a critique to say that in London doesn't work. London is a wonderful place, it has a lot of opportunities, and when you start to compare to these mega cities where it's gated communities, I mean, this doesn't exist here. So I think we're very privileged, but nevertheless, it's a social experiment, and it's growing. That's the intriguing part. Are nomadic people less likely to commit murder? Are they less likely to abuse children physically or sexually? Absolutely <laughs> terrible. Yeah, like rape, murder. It's better instead. Like, uh, is that more yeah, just but there's no nature. reporting of it. There's no police. There's no yeah. So it's funny. Well, yeah, uh, you're incredible. Desmond Morris's view is a bit more nuanced. He doesn't say that cities are bad. No. He says that it's there's a balance there. And so if you in the sort of stimulus struggle idea, you get a balance of you know being over stimulated or under stimulated. You know, if you get that balance right, and well, that cities can enable creativity. Creativity versus conformity. So if you get that balance right. So yeah, the idea that, that in, a, in, in a modern environment people might be understimulated or overstimulated because their basic survival needs are very well covered and so they've got the spare time, spare energy, spare resources. What do, do they do with that? And they, if they can manage to get the balance right. So, so he's not saying cities are bad by any means. He's saying it's really got to get the balance right. I mm, think the first behavioural ecology textbook was written after which behavioural ecology is sort of looking at animal behaviour in the context of evolution. The first, I'm pretty sure the first animal behaviour textbook was written a little bit after this book. So, you know, that's sort of... So the state of play is completely different. I'm really interested you are talking about the... Uh, well, I would have asked you that question if you hadn't said what you just said. <laughs> and I just assumed that a lot of his ideas were no longer um, tenable. Yeah. That, that because of what you just said about that we have much more knowledge now about human behavior. And you know, I'm reading it, I, I read it 50 years after it was published first, right. and it has that vibe where it was an exciting, you know, it still reads like an exciting book, but I... My personal opinion is that we're getting to the stage now where we're going, well, you know, let's look very seriously at animal and human behaviour. Let's take the opinion that behaviour, like everything else ever, pretty much, is shaped through selection. So if there are differences, where are they? And if we were to take the opinion of any other arbitrary species, would the differences from that perspective be any bigger than the differences we see now? So, you know, it's this... I, I, I just want to add, um, for me, the reason why I thought it was an interesting platform to use is that once you get into things like um, evolutionary psychology... You can and speak up, please. Yeah, I, you know, I said that why I'm using the book as a platform is that what when you um, start looking at things like evolutionary psychology and you start looking at people like Richard Dawkins in 74 writing books, is that even in that field, when you listen to people when they argue, even within the field of evolutionary psychology, they have arguments about things that seem to be quite fundamental. And that surprises me that things that are so far off, like this is, someone might argue and say that xenophobia comes from when we were 13 species on the planet fighting out and therefore still children up to five will have this, I mean, this is an argument. And to me, it's like, this is wild as this book, you know, and this is the present day where 
lucid individuals from one of you, and no, but I'm just saying that, no, 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 and, and I'm sitting there going, Jesus, this is not my field, that it's a timepiece, and but still it, it's, it's, it's just incredible that the, the nuances, it's even wider than that in specific. The way in which he was ahead of his time is just in combining so many disciplines, which is very, very fascinating. Yeah. bring the disciplines together, but in that book he's doing that. I mean, he doesn't talk about economics directly very much, but it's sort of implicit in a lot of what he writes. And yeah. when he talks about the city, that's an economist's view of the urban environment. So it's quite interesting to see him covering such a lot of ground. Can I just ask, how much difference does like, the director of the zoo make? You know, say London Zoo, you know, what difference does the mayor make? question of governance of the city and that's what one going back to your point before about the way in which large sections of the community are excluded from the housing market and that you know a lot of government policy focus very much on boosting demand for housing. What about the supply of housing? What about supply of good quality housing? I mean they're very crucial questions and I don't think governments and policymakers have really engaged with it very much. It can't be argued that there's actually, in some respect, greater freedom in a city. Because I, I grew up in a yeah. tiny, yeah. tiny village, yeah. and I have, when it comes to things that I want to do, in certain respects, I have more freedom in a city. Because in a small community, there are so many things I'm not allowed to do or be. You know, so it's, so it's not just about the For negative instance. things, but there can be. Freedom. No, I mean, well, I mean, in the village that I come from, you know, you you certainly can't have a different skin color. You can't have a non-heterosexual sexuality, you you know, you, you can't have any kind of job that isn't a very standard. Maurice, he speaks about education and he says mm -hmm. that it's because we live in, in such a close environment that the education has to be very strict. Uh, so in a, you could argue that it removes some of your freedom because if, if we were all living in huge spaces, we might not be as aggressive against each other because we, we will not have to compete for resources and status. And status. So do, 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 don't you think that it could also be the other around, but we could lose a little bit of our freedom because we live in... Yeah, I mean, I think there's so, many, there's so many factors, but I would say in terms of the aggression, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, in my own experience, I wouldn't necessarily say there's less competition or less aggression in a, in a very sparsely populated area. Well, uh, you seem to all of London. Let me give you an example. <laughs> the tube, right? In the morning in the tube, we've all seen that when we are tired and when we have someone next to us who is annoying, we just want to beat that person, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we don't, but it's, uh, at this point we say it's because of education. But uh, when we are forced to live in an environment with so many people, it, it, it brings us very aggressive no? I think given the volume of people that travel on the tube, there was a, an article in The Economist uh, just a couple of weeks ago that has a wonderful chart of when it's the worst time to get the tube, so I plan my journeys now around this, this chart that tells you. Well, thousands of people moving on the tube each morning and afternoon, and it's an incredible volume of people. And the fact that there is so little violence gives that incredible volume of people moving around. I mean, it's the cities that's made us less violent, isn't it? Of the or is it the establishment of the police force uh, in London? Well, the murder. Mean, you didn't never went out at night. Yeah, London. like you know, no gas, no lights, nothing. If you went out, you went out in a handsome cab, otherwise you were dead. Yeah. Somebody would get you. Somebody would get you. <laughs> so you got the what's it? Both street runners, New Scotland Yard. It took a long time to get it. It's only no less than two hundred years old. I think we're sort of just maybe past like the turning curve where. I find that will actually select, often select for cooperation. Like, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, it's not, you know, like, you know, countries aren't built of one person. You know, it's, and same in animals, and same in species, and same, like, you know, there's that whole thing, you know, 90% of a 
a human is not human. You know, we're all successes in cooperation. And I think that's starting to come through now. This is, sorry, really, you know, is there anything to, to show whether animals are more violent when they're in the zoo than when they're in the wild? Oh, I think, I, I mean, I don't know, but I would, if I was to guess, I'd say yes, because if you make anything just, and some zoos are great, but if you put anything in an environment that makes it extremely stressed, it will not be happy. And we talk about violence as well. Obviously with our intelligence as humans, we don't necessarily need to have violent fights to have violence against someone, I think, as well. Especially in a work environment, for example, there's plenty of opportunities for bullying and in school as well. And if you watch children, I'm a primary school teacher, it's fascinating to watch the way that they don't necessarily use violence to just get one up and ship on each other, which essentially is what animals are doing. You know, the biggest gorilla or the biggest uh, male is using violence because that's what their intelligence brings them to. They haven't got that interaction that we have with words. And I think that that happens day in, day out with humans in society. As a species and in the 20th century, we're in a sort of time of uh, remote violence, you know, where culture is, these sort of super tribes we can enact, can act, break violence remotely. You don't have to go and attack someone yeah. personally and physically. You know, the latest stage of obviously being uh, drone. Because it's sort of a, you know, someone with the stats on violence, uh, you know, if that's some cheeky stats, the fact that But then if we are in remote violence, it means that the entire humanity becomes a huge tribe in which power is... is most of the I mean, that's seemingly the next logical step from the cities to kind of zoos up to, you know, uh, whatever area of humanity as a whole occupies. I mean, there are fewer and fewer really kind of wild areas of the planet, more and more domesticated ones. You know, I mean, I can go out to... Uh, you know, I love London, but I still need to get away from it. I don't often go out to parts of the Mid Wales, uh, which is quite rural, but it's still, you know, incredibly domesticated, and it's in some ways not much different from the zoo. It's still, you know, there are still lots of people there, even though it's the countryside. It's still completely artificial in lots of ways. And you know, I mean, you do think, well, that's the logical, you know, direction the whole planet would seem to be heading, going where we're going. So, and then we're left with no alternative. There's a sort of romantic element to that, I think, too. I mean, you know, people are talking about needing to go to green spaces and things. I mean, I, I happen to be lucky enough to live kind of half my life in a really remote part of Wales, where, which is a sort of, it would be wrong to describe my life as agricultural, but it's more agricultural than it is when I'm here in London. But I find, I think, that I. I can get more angry about things to do with what happens on the land than I can do about, say, the bank cheating me when I'm in London, because it's more abstract. And I think, you know, when, you know, even something like somebody parking on a bit of ground, or, you know, that comes into the city, but things to do, I think it's things where we can visualize uh, these sort of things very simply are more capable of making us aggressive than things where we've, we're sort of sunk in a morass of complexity and we don't know who's cheating us how and in what way. And in some ways, we can live with that more easily, or maybe I can. So how do we envision the future? Do we? I mean, hearing from you, I would just wish that the population of the world would double and then everything would be better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <it's> just... <laughs> Is it how you see the future, or, or, or is there a limit uh, after which really we become too many people on Earth? On Earth? And, um, and in terms of evolution as well, are we still... Um, are we still... How, how is the human going to evolve in, in today's world? Are we going to... Uh, is our species going to adapt to this... Uh, environment we've constructed, uh, and how is it going to adapt? There's an interesting part of the book towards the end that reminded me a bit of Malthus, and the idea of you know, populations getting out of control.
control an epidemic yeah. taking over. And he actually does talk about that. <coughs> if you can manage that, so you anticipate what sort of problems might emerge yeah. from a, a population that's growing too rapidly and plan for it, then you, you overcome the potential problem that the whole human race is going to be wiped out if we don't prepare yeah. for the things that might be it, 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 change. Yes, which, uh, yeah, and I was going to say, because he doesn't talk so much about climate change himself, but I, I sometimes think the human population, that we're all like pests in a way, you know, like cockroaches on the earth just consuming all the resources and what's going to happen to the environment, mm. you know, all those sorts of, which is quite a dis mean, dystopian view. When you, when you look at um, city like London, mm. So I think that, that issue of, of pop, population growth is, that is too rapid is definitely a big, big problem. No, that's not, that's not going to be... Did you to that to that? I thought it was very interesting when you, when you start looking at these things and in terms of how cities work, also what you noticed in, in a certain way that the idea of being, as they would say, post-Darwinian or post, you know, like, we now are starting to survive better in spaces where perhaps we shouldn't, thanks to information and sharing of information. We look at things that uh, the color, or I don't know what the correct word is, but when the AIDS virus and the HIV virus first came, how that has evolved and how it's changed and, and how we've dealt with it. I mean, it, it's you know, still there, it's still doing weak massive havoc. It's just very interesting in terms of how we've changed. And now all of a sudden, we can live in a tighter if we want to. You could argue that the same technology that allowed the Ebola virus to grow so quickly, and that threatened all of us in terms of worrying that someone might get on a plane and fly to London or New York, yeah. is the same technology that allowed medical people to fly to a region yeah. and get there quickly. And, and but also, I think, um, I think the fact that we're able to deal with epidemics like Ebola or HIV um, is a problem in some ways. I mean, I actually used to work in HIV healthcare, and there, what you found is you had this weird seesaw effect all the time where you get an epidemic under control in one country for a while, and then there'd be this massive side of relief, and everyone would stop doing the things that brought it under control and come back. I mean, we have this kind of, uh, kind of exceptionalist view of our species that we can kind of solve any problem uh, with technology or with kind of something lifestyle change and you know, I think eventually something's going to come along that we don't anticipate or we can't adapt to and it is going to end up. But the third of the world is already under population control now, so that would be China, right? And it's only a matter of time, I imagine, for countries like Egypt and India would consider it. In Europe it's um, almost self-regulating and cut up and having less children, so I think, uh, okay. and then China would have um, controlled urbanisation as well, with their, um, they won't allow people to move yeah. freely. So what I would about people going to move around and come to big areas like the city? Yes, yeah, so in China you're not allowed to. So they have restrictions on where you can move to and where you can work and where you can consume resources. <coughs> and I mean, it's probably not a model we want to copy. It so. sounds wow. great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sounds like a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's a desert. Well, well, uh, <laughs> literally, literally, you can drive from, you can leave my house and drive for 10 hours and not see anything. Anything. And That's you due to the US immigration policy, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With um, population density, I think, and mental health and suicide rates. Yeah. And um, I'd be interested to see, with regards to anxiety and depression, in the animal kingdom. Um, and I say that whether or not there are cases of anxiety and depression, whether we know that happens in the animal kingdom. And I say that because when I have been to zoos and you see a polar bear, for example, doing laps of his cage, and just looks depressed and horrible. You know, actually showing something scientifically, especially, maybe not especially, but especially in um, something like behavioral ecology is very difficult. So showing something like anxiety, showing these sort of things, even though, you know, everybody knows that, you know, if you if you go and kill an orangutan's um, child in front of the mother, you know, they'll get, you know, they'll get depressed. You know, you can, it's this, it's, it has to be there because that's how science works in this sort of very, it's very hard to show it, 
because it has to be. Like, you know, the, do you, um, I'm sure a lot of you would know of the Mimic Octopus, this octopus that can sort of change really quickly between these. That hasn't been shown to be an actual Mimic. Like, you know, even though, go on YouTube, there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views of this thing, actually showing that it's mimicking hasn't been quantitatively shown. So you've got this required disconnect between what you can actually say and what is popularly known. So when you get to things like anxiety, depression, when you get to things like what was coming up before, like, you know, homosexuality is just one example because this guy at Tring at the University, uh, not the University, the Natural History Museum at Tring, did this really nice study a few years ago where he went through like old, uh, Douglas Russell, one of the curators there, went through this, um, these old uh, notebooks of one of the explorers and the, you know, where he find penguins and found, you know, <laughs> records, you know, where are you find them, not the southern Nazis, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> um, you know, good cases of homosexuality, but actually showing these things in a way that then is accepted by science, you know, and it builds into that point I was saying before where it's a really fun time to be science because, you know, what, what everyone accepts and what's actually been shown are two different things. So, you know, it's this, it's this funny, necessary, but funny disconnect where you, I think, you know, and it builds into this broader idea where if you, in my opinion, if you were to uh, talk about how we can be projected to adapt to things like climate change, to things which, you know, if you sit there and look at any reasonable person, you know, within the fields, uh, you know, uh, opinion or whatever, you know, their, their interpretation of the data um, and the data. Um, it's a huge risk, but, you know, we can go, oh yeah, well, we're so intelligent, so we'll be all right, so don't worry about it, no worries. I think one of the most interesting things we could do would be to look at the, the pace at which we're able to adapt to these things. Because what we really want to know, and I think a really fundamental question in the study of behaviour, is how well are we able to adapt to change compared to a comparable change in another animal? Because at the moment I think there is, and this is just sort of on the fly, so whatever, but I think there could be a big disconnect between, you know, say for example, we go, well, we are better than this, than this species, so therefore we are smart. Where that's not really the way, in my opinion, that evolution works, where it's more of a within species process that basically drags everyone down to average. So what you really want to be doing is comparing how species X is able to deal with situation X compared to species Y being able to deal with, you know, so like comparing those curves and if we are in fact faster, then you know, you go, well, we're more adaptable as a species, but it's this measure of adaptability. So, I think that's kind of a very messy way of drawing what you were saying with what was being said before. <laughs> you know, like, I think it's this funny thing and these funny disconnects between understanding human behavior and animal behavior as if they're two separate things, but if studied in the context of evolution, it's not really human and animal behavior, it's behavior of things that aren't dead. <laughs> you know, like, uh, which then builds into this idea of like, are humans still evolving? It's like, well, we're not all dead, so we're still kind of evolving, you know, like, you know. Let's jump on social media. Um, the thing was, in the book, obviously, written in 1969, uh, he slightly touches upon the idea that, you know, TV is a one-way medium, and therefore, we won't see much change in humanity until we have a two-way uh, medium, like social media today. Places even that won't necessarily change your behavior, nevertheless. So here's the question to you guys. When people come to the city, it is to reinvent themselves, potentially, but also, as he argues, potentially to become not the president of the United States, but to be top of their own pseudo tribe. Is that you connect with people that you could arguably potentially be the top of your food chain in a behavioral way. And I was just wondering like how your feelings are in terms of today with social media, things like 
LinkedIn where people keep updating to say like, you got a new job, but you just got promoted, and all of a sudden you got to invent shit, you know? <laughs> like you got to go, what am I doing? No, but it's, it's incredibly interesting that perhaps the outlet is not aggression, but it's uh, pseudo-dominance by this is what I'm doing. So, and I, I, I don't know your experience of this, because that's what I thought was interesting about in the book, is that it doesn't even touch on that subject. It's just, but now we live in the duality of two lives at the same time, multiple lives. You know, we didn't even talk either quickly about the virtual city, because there's now a virtual city. Absolutely. And we talk about the fact that you can now find, if you're crazy, you can find crazy people that are crazy like you, and even though in reality there might only be less than a percentage of a percentage, now suddenly there's 13,000 of them in a room in the city, and you can become the king of this virtual city. <laughs> but that's it. I don't know what that means. No, but it's exciting stuff. I just want to pick up something you said that's kind of unrelated, which is when you said when people come to the city. I mean, lots yes. of the discussion today has been about people coming to the city. Yes. The other factor is that people Living. like me who were born here and kind of don't really have experience in anywhere else. Yeah. So there's almost, a, this is probably a discussion for another time, but yeah, later or not. with drinks, but you know, there are possibly even kind of two species cohabiting in this city. I mean, my sister is probably more South East London than, uh, and probably struggle to find someone who's more kind of South East London, at least in appearance. Uh, she hates the very kind of South East London, you know, kind of accent, <coughs> clothes, all that kind of stuff. But she, um, she, she gets, I've seen her actually get slightly kind of like uh, uncomfortable outside the city when you go to the countryside, she becomes kind of, uh, you know, can't get a Wi Fi signal and stuff like that. So, but, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. So, please have a good